the breakout from decapitated science to a new renaissance begins when the recognition dawns that the 99.999% of the mass of the universe that the masters of empire want humanity believe does not exist, does indeed exist. It exists in the form of plasma that pervades all cosmic space. With this single recognition, an entirely different universe comes to light. The universe comes to light as no longer being isolated and entropic, careening towards its eventual heat death as every sun consumes itself and dies. Instead, the universe comes to light as a single whole, united by vast energy streams that power the billions of galaxies that exist and the hundreds of billions of stars in each one of them, in an anti-entropic process, by which the universe grows, both in quality and quantity. The difference between decapitated science and the liberated science is so revolutionary that it changes the entire face of science. Science now deals with a profound truth, instead of just shadow images that do not reflect what is actually real. Plato understood the dynamics involved with a breakout in science into the real world. Plato was a champion in breaking away from the imprisoning sophistry that had dragged Athens into the long Peloponnesian War that had nearly destroyed the once proud Greek classical culture. Plato was a pioneer for freedom in scientific perception, the freedom to reach for the truth. Plato had many students, though he was a student himself of the great Socrates. He used the method of teaching by parable to illustrate his most profound concepts like the path for breaking away from mysticism to reality. Plato illustrated the dynamics of breaking out from perceptional imprisonment with his parable of the cave. The parable is found in his book The Republic. In the parable, Plato describes a group of prisoners in a cave who are chained behind a barrier. They have been there for so long that this dark world is the only world they knew, a world that was defined for them by shadow images projected on the wall above them. The images were produced by objects passed in front of the fire in the cave, which the prisoners could not see, but they could see the light reflected on the walls and ceilings, and the shadow images of objects in front of the fire. Then, one day, one of the prisoners breaks free from his chains. He climbs over the barrier. As he does, he discovers with amazement that the shadows they had been seeing dancing and moving for many years were nothing more than just illusions. The man's entire perception of reality had suddenly changed in that single moment of a profound realization. Before long, the self-freed prisoner discovers that there exists an exit from the cave. He discovers that a vast bright, sun-filled world lies outside the cave, a world that he had never imagined to exist. He discovers that the freedom that he gave himself was far more than just the freedom from chains, but that it gave him a whole new world where everything was real and understandable and profound. To him, being free, suddenly meant so much more than he ever imagined it would. This is the type of freedom that comes to light 
when the discovery is made that the 99.999% of the mass of the universe that the masters say doesn't exist, does actually exist. That it exists as plasma, free-flowing in cosmic space, which can be discovered by its effects, and in some cases can actually be seen. Thus, the self-liberated person, no longer a prisoner now, discovers the real universe that is far bigger than he ever imagined it to be. He discovers that his cave walled shadows that he had believed to be real, such as the nuclear fusion-powered sun, was a miss where nothing is real, where the world he saw was nothing more than a miss conjured up in imprisoned science, a world of orchestrated illusions. Outside of the cave, in the wider world, he recognized that the real world is far more profound. He looks at the sun. He looks at the sunspots. He sees with his own eyes, aided by a telescope perhaps, that the sunspots are darker. As he realizes that the sunspots are holes torn into the photosphere, and by seeing with his own eyes that the deeper layers below the radiant surface of the sun are darker and colder, the recognition dawns on him that the sun is not heated from the inside by the fabled nuclear fusion process. He reasons that if the sun was heated from the inside, the lower layers below the sunspots would be hotter and brighter instead of being substantially darker and colder. He realizes by looking at the sunspots that the sun is externally powered by inflowing streams of plasma electric energy, the very energy that the masters say does not exist. While he realizes, too, that what he thus sees in his mind by observing the evidence, a further recognition dawns on him that the fabled proton-to-proton fusion power that supposedly powers the sun is not possible for reasons that nuclear fusion is an energy-consuming process and not an energy-producing process. Nor would a sun have a need to produce its own energy when the entire universe is filled with energy, when energy is its second name. The liberated person no longer a prisoner now, realizes instantly that when an atom bomb is exploded, a large atom is broken apart whereby a portion of the latent stored-up energy is released that had been previously invested in the atom-building process. He also realizes that the same happens in a hydrogen bomb explosion. Here, Two overbuilt atoms, tritium and titerium, are combined in a manner that a portion is left over that becomes jettisoned, whereby the bound-up latent jettisoned energy is released. No energy is actually being produced in either process. Consequently, no energy is being produced by the sun either. The sun is not an entropic furnace that burns itself out. It is instead a part of an anti-entropic network of cosmic energy streams that power every sun, in which our sun functions essentially as but a cosmic catalytic energy converter. It glows brilliantly with the electric energy flowing into it, attracted in part by gravity and in part by the electric force. Thus flowing streams of electric energy are inherent in the nature of plasma that fills all space. The self-liberated man, who is no longer a prisoner now, also makes another profound discovery 
by just looking at the evidence that the sun presents to us. He discovers that the brightness of the sun is a function of the density of the electric energy flowing into it. He discovers thereby that the radiance of the sun is not a constant factor at all, as the myths would make us all believe, but that instead the luminance of the sun varies greatly with the cycles of the electric density that acts on it. He sees this to be the case rather dramatically when the sun is observed in the high U-band of the energy spectrum. There its luminance varies a whopping twentyfold during each of its eleven-year solar cycles. Our sun is anything but a constant factor. This is where we are today. While nearly the entire field of cosmic science remains imprisoned in the cave of deep darkness, where the only light is that which serves the theatrics of illusions, a few breakouts have been made, and those occurrences have been kept quietly under wraps. This sad state of affairs has momentous implications that will continue for as long as society remains imprisoned in the cave where truth is kept out. The consequences are tragic, and they promise to be infinitely more so in the near future. This is what the self-freed person can see rather clearly, who is not a prisoner anymore. By having escaped the cave to the real world, it is becoming rather plain to him to recognize that the cave that was his former world is about to be flooded with the coming change in the weather. He sees rainstorms already happening and great storms causing floods where no one would expect them. He sees the clouds becoming darker. He fears for his former fellow inmates who are still remaining in the cave. He knows that he must go back to alert them and inspire them to rescue themselves. But how can they in the cave hear him when he speaks of things that the long-time imprisoned people have never seen and have no reference for in their dark world of illusions, which they are told is the universe and which their limited perceptions confirm. But can we use the excuse that the prisoners have for ourselves, especially today with the weather already changing massively? The weather is changing in such a big way that no one could not have felt the consequences of the ongoing transition. The evidence is all around us and the consequences are mounting up. Yes, a transition is in progress. The Ice Age transition has already begun. It is here. It is happening regardless of the fact that the society remains chained up in its cave of stupefying illusions that can also be called imprisoned science or decapitated science. The telltale evidence of the Ice Age transition storm that is in progress is visible in four different areas in the form of four major astrophysical aspects that all have a common cause. Number one, we see a weakening sun. Number two, we see sharply increased earthquakes all over the world. Number three, we see already a massive increase in cosmic reflux. Number four, we see a progressive weakening of the greenhouse effect that keeps our climate in moderation. The cause for all of these four aspects is the now ongoing reduction of the electric energy density in the local space in which our solar system is located. These four aspects are poised to have enormous effects, far more than we may imagine. Number one, 
The dimmer sun will cause vast ice sheets to form anew in the northern hemisphere, where much of our food is presently grown. However, this isn't the big thing, because we as human beings have the power to relocate our agriculture far out of the endangered regions into the tropics. We might place most of it afloat on the equatorial seas, since this would be the most efficient solution enabled by automated industrial production. The end result will be that we come out of the already mounting food crisis far richer than we yet imagined, with a much more powerful civilization in all its numerous aspects. The now unfolding Ice Age transition will forcibly inspire us, will forcibly inspire us to get us out of our easy chair and apply our potential to develop the great productive power that we have as human beings. Number two. The earthquakes are increasing. The increase is a part of the package. This aspect of the transition cannot be avoided. Still, it isn't anything to cry over. As human beings, we have the power to adjust our living accordingly. We can manufacture brand new cities, produce them in great quantities, and place them afloat on the disease where earthquakes cannot affect them, no matter how strong they might become. Here too, we will come out richer as we get ourselves out of the easy chair and utilize the creative and productive power that we have as human beings to produce those brand new floating cities in great numbers with the power of automated high temperature industrial processes. These types of brand new cities could already be produced with existing technologies and resources and with so little effort that society could provide them to itself for free as a credit for the future, a wealth creating investment by society into itself. Number three. Yes, the cosmic reflux is increasing. NASA's Ulysses satellite has measured a 20% increase, and that's where the real fun begins. That's a result of the weaker sun that Ulysses has also measured, which results into a weaker heliosphere. The consequent increase in cosmic reflux reaching the Earth nets us huge benefits. Cosmic rays are typically high-energy electrons and protons moving up to near the speed of light. That's electricity in motion. Electricity in motion creates a moving magnetic field which in turn generates secondary electricity. By this process, all commercial electricity is being generated. When the cosmic ray electricity passes through the human body at a rate of 50,000 particles per day, while the cosmic ray particles won't collide with anything their motion generates secondary electric currents in the body that enhance the living biological processes. All biological processes are to a large degree electrically operated. We have lived during the interglacial in a cosmic restarved world. The Ice Age epoch that corresponds with a weaker sun and a weaker heliosphere provides a much richer cosmic ray electric environment as less of the cosmic ray flux is blocked by the weaker heliosphere in an Ice Age environment. It may have been the more powerful electric environment in the Ice Ages that has enabled the amazing development of humanity in the first place. This makes us literally the children of the cosmic ray flux of the Ice Ages. 
That was an epoch of the highest cosmic ray energy input into the biosphere in the last 450 million years. The kind of high-powered cosmic ray epoch in which humanity emerged began more than two million years ago, the previous time when similar conditions occurred takes us back 450 million years when the great proliferation of life began on this planet in the Ordovician time frame. We now experience similar conditions and possibly more powerful conditions than those in which we ourselves began to develop. This is the promise of the Pleistocene epoch to us, which will likely be with us for another 10 million years, and will likely be increasing for the next 3 million years. That's something to celebrate rather than to dread. Number 4. The measured increase of cosmic reflux increases the cloud formation in the troposphere. Increased cloud formation reduces the greenhouse effect. The result of this process is widely evident in weather consequences around the Earth. The weather is indeed changing. The Earth's troposphere that is 6 to 20 kilometers thick, where the weather is created, contains 80% of the mass of the atmosphere and almost all of its water vapor that produces 97% of the greenhouse effect. That's where cloud formation happens, and it takes a toll on the water vapor, which thereby reduces the greenhouse effects that moderate our climate. The greenhouse effects reduce the otherwise large temperature swings that we would experience. With the greenhouse protection now getting weaker, more infrastructures are needed to make up for the shortfall including large water supply systems to compensate for the resulting drought conditions that are now becoming ever more prevalent. In addition, the Earth is getting colder as increased cloudiness reflects more of the incoming solar energy back into space. The white top of the clouds are highly reflective. The cooling effect that this has on Earth is also universally evident in numerous ways, which are too many to list here. Of course, the resulting new weather patterns do not pose a critical problem, since the needed infrastructures to compensate for them can be built relatively easily. And so, they will be built. Also, they will likely be built on a kind of large scale that matches the scale of the unfolding global challenge, which is to rapidly develop new food production capabilities, such as by irrigating the Sahara Desert and bringing water to other dry regions. The concept of water supply infrastructures will then be raised to higher levels of developmental power, to levels that have never been seen before. And this will likely happen soon. The principles for it already exist, and the materials and energy resources to implement the principles do likewise exist. And best of all, the requisite principles can be implemented fast, and the resulting infrastructures can be expanded with the increasing needs in step with the Ice Age transition advancing. For all the above reasons, the new Ice Age that is already unfolding, slight as it presently is, should inspire a great celebration as it singles a new dawn for all mankind with a renaissance of such power in universal economic development that the likes of it has not been seen on Earth in its entire history. While the dawn of a new Ice Age is unfolding, the breakout of humanity from the prison cave where science remains decapitated and tied to the earth is also unfolding and progressing. The breakout into unfettered freedom cannot be held back. It is proceeding with astrophysical power 
with cosmic ray power. Here, the phase truly applies to all of humanity. Resistance is futile. The phrase applies especially to empire, as the new dawn will be its doom, where the phrase applies in big letters, resistance is futile. The system of oligarchy will end at this stage, while the new world, the Ice Age world, unfolds every more. The critical part for us, however, for humanity as a whole, is determined by the message of the universe that needs to be understood. That resistance against its dynamics is futile. And this begins with the recognition of plasma in space that as particles is 100,000 times smaller than an atom, but makes up 99.999% of the mass of the universe in which the power of the universe is located including cosmic ray power that appears to have enabled the human presence to develop. When empire controls science, 99.999% of the universe is deemed not to exist. That's tragic quackery. Here resistance, resistance to quackery and mental imprisonment is liberating. It opens the door to profound discoveries. One of the most challenging discoveries that will be made on this front, where reality is acknowledged, is that the now sharply increasing earthquakes on our planet are a logical consequence of the dynamics of a weakening sun. The recognition will be resisted until the principle that causes the phenomenon becomes understood, or as one might put it, when science becomes liberated from its impotence. Until such a time, the strongest evidence for the truth remains an enigma. And the evidence that we have before us is strong. Sure, great efforts are made to explain the evidence away by tying it to mythological causes. Decapitated science abounds with mythological concepts that are designed to explain away the truth. The fact remains, however, that in the same time frame in which the sun became dimmer, as measured by NASA's Ulysses spacecraft in terms of reduced solar wind pressure, earthquakes have increased in lockstep nearly all over the world, and not by just a few percent or even 100% but have increased 14-fold above the historic average, even up to 72-fold in some cases. These are enormous increases that have never been experienced before according to the historic records. Nevertheless, the connection between the weakening sun and the increase of earthquakes cannot be drawn while the connecting astrophysical element is deemed not to exist, whereby the increased earthquakes remain an enigma. This means that we face a paradox. The increase in earthquakes is not theoretical, nor is it something that might happen in some distant times, far down the future. It is happening now. The weakening sun, too, is happening now as Ulysses has already measured it. Every aspect of the weakening sun has already enormously large consequences, such as increased tornadoes, cloudiness, colder climates, erratic weather, droughts, flooding, and so on. Still, the evidence that the Earth is not isolated from the dynamics of the solar universe is not allowed to be drawn into the conclusions, because the missing link the plasma link is deemed not to exist. Thus, the paradox remains unresolved and the phenomenon mystified. Nevertheless, some type of big transition is evidently in progress. However, for as long as the truth remains in prison, far-flung mist becomes conjured up to explain the phenomena. One misses that the Earth is changing on its own massively worldwide. 
it would be far more rational though to assume that it is the cosmic environment that is in transition and that this larger environment includes changing forces that are bearing down on the earth with changing effects. While this recognition is gradually being made, it remains far from the recognition that ties these effects to the Ice Age transition that is apparently in its early stages. All the features that one would expect to see associated with an astrophysical transition, if the truth was allowed to be recognized, are already beginning to hit us over the head, to jolt us to attention, to stop us dreaming about a reality that is devoid of the truth. Logic should tell us that the four phenomena, the dimmer sun, the increased earthquakes, the increased cosmic radiation, and the weaker greenhouse effect of the Earth's atmosphere, are all facets of a single cause, that is the weakening of the electric plasma surrounding the sun that powers the sun. While each of the four phenomena is a major topic by itself, the enormous scale of the consequences already observed in each of the four areas should have already caused corresponding scientific responses by humanity all across the world, instead of no one raising as much as an eyebrow. The missing responses are not surprising if one considers that society's primary power engine is science, has not just been merely turned off, but has been turned upside down. The noble truth that underlies the entire universe has been jettisoned from science, as it were. The sun has become mythologized. In reality, our sun is not an isolated self-powered fusion furnace, but is a part of a vast anti-entropic universal energy stream of electric plasma that pervades all space and power every galaxy and every sun within it. Our sun doesn't create energy, but attracts it. The attraction concentrates it. The concentration is so dense at its surface that the electric interaction becomes intensely brilliant with a current temperature of 5,780 degrees Kelvin or 5,500 degrees Celsius. Our sun is a cosmic powered catalytic energy converter. Its surface is a fast sea of electric interaction in high-powered plasma streams. Our sun doesn't produce power, it doesn't need to. Power is the second name of the universe. The universe is power. It lights up every sun in every galaxy. Electric plasma carries the universal powering impetus. Our sun is not a gravity-powered entropic nuclear fusion furnace. No viable principle exists to cause such a phenomenon. Nor does the visible evidence support such a theory. The theory is a deception. This is important to recognize. When the sun is seen as a nuclear fusion furnace, it is regarded as an invariable constant. This means that all the phenomena that we now see occurring on Earth, even the phenomenon of the Ice Ages, must, as a result, be regarded as being caused elsewhere instead of being related to a variable sun that a catalytic sun is. In order to maintain the delusion that the sun is a self-powered constant factor and that electric plasma plays no role in the cosmic scale, a number of mythological concepts of the galaxy have been developed that are deemed to mysteriously cause all the anomalies that we now see by which the real nature of the universe becomes hidden and society's reaction to its actual characteristics becomes prevented. As a consequence of hiding the nature of reality, 
No preparations are being made to meet the challenges of the Ice Age transition that is already in progress. The strategic protection of humanity against the natural dynamic cycles that affect our world, which the Ice Age transition is an element of, is thereby being prevented. Tragic consequences lay in our way, therefore, that appear to be intended. In the decapitated modern science, where 99.999% of the mass of the universe is deemed not to exist, as plasma is deemed not to exist in interstellar and intergalactic space, the electric force of the universe is thereby necessarily disavowed to exist. In this decapitated science, only the force of gravity is acknowledged as the acting force in cosmic space, to which every phenomenon in the universe, including the Ice Age phenomenon, is subsequently attributed. In this decapitated sphere of perception, that is ironically still called science, our Sun is deemed to be an orbiting star on a path around the galactic center. All stars are deemed to be so orbiting. Kepler's discovery in the 1600s rendered the concept of orbiting stars to be totally impossible. In order to hide this fact too, Kepler has been thrown out of the window in decapitated cosmic science. Since the visual evidence doesn't support the theory of orbiting stars, a highly imaginary density wave theory has been invented to make the evidence match the mythology, like Ptolemy had done when he invented the mythical epicycle and the equant. The density wave theory he imagines the stellar orbits to bunch together to form the appearance of galactic spiral structures, which are deemed not to exist in reality. Of course, rigorous proof isn't needed in decapitated science, especially when it stands in the way of politically motivated apocalyptic tales of natural extinction cycles. Apocalyptic scares create problems in the mind for which no solution are possible, which forces the mind into an infantile state. Another form of decapitated science envisions the solar system bobbing up and down across the ecliptic while it orbits the galactic center, for which no physical principle exists either or is possible to make this happen. The resulting mind-numbing mythological confusion is meshed together with the Big Bang theory of the universe. In the jungle of imposed mythological confusion that increasingly cripples the functioning of science, the general recognition of the Ice Age dynamics becomes blocked with the result that all the precursors are ignored and no preparations are made for the strategic defense of humanity against the coming Ice Age transition. The mythological confusion was created to counter the advances in electric cosmology, where all observed phenomena accord with simple electric processes that can in most cases be replicated in the laboratory. Here, everything is simple, logical, and accords with known universal plasma electric principles. No mystery rules here. In the real world, no mysticism is needed to explain the very long climate cycles of 62 and 144 million years in duration for which orbiting stars are imagined that violate all known principles. 
or solar systems bobbing up and down as they orbit, for which no physical principle exists either. Nor is the density wave mythology needed to give us the 144 million year cycles. The universe is much more lawful, simple, and orderly than that. In the real world, all galaxies are electrically interconnected by vast currents of plasma electricity. The connections are typically not visible and cross vast distances. Only on rare occasions are the currents strong enough to emit light, or barely so. In most cases, the interconnection is recognizable only by the string-like alignment of the galaxies to each other in the electric current streams that power them. It is there in the intergalactic currents, named Birkland currents, where we find the very long climate cycles located. The cycles exist as electric resonance cycles. All electric plasma structures have resonance cycles with time frames corresponding to the size of the resonating structures. Our galaxy has logically two such segments with very long cycle times. One gives us the 62 million year cycles and the other the 144 million year cycles, which interactively affect the entire galaxy. Energetic resonance systems are widely common. Even the children's swing of the playground has a specific resonance. In the case of the swing, the cycle time depends on the length of the chains. On the scale of the solar system, the 11-year solar cycles are evidently also resonance cycles. Here, they occur within the electric plasma structure of the heliosphere. And on the larger stage, the galactic stage, the 110,000-year ice age cycles are evidently pulsing electric discharge cycles. Pulsing phenomena are fairly common in electric structures. We find them in the case of pulsars that pulse tens of times per second, like the one found at the core of the Crab Nebula. We also find pulse systems in water parks in the form of the dump bucket that flips over every few minutes depending on how fast it is being filled. With the sun being electrically powered, it stands to reason that the cosmic effects on our climate are nothing more than the natural effects of the various cosmic electric cycles interacting. No magic is involved. No orbital mechanics is needed. The universe is electric in nature and dynamic. The mythical orbital cycles, density waves, and bobbing motions of solar systems exist only in the fantasy world of decapitated science, where 99.999% of the universe is deemed not to exist, since plasma is deemed not to exist in space. As a result of this decapitation, wildly mythical concepts are needed to explain anything. The theories that emerge from that are pure fantasy. It is evidently not possible to recognize the nature of a physical construct by leaving out 99.999% of it and the most essential and the most powerful part at that. To attempt such a hopeless quest is akin to one trying to explore the artwork of Van Gogh 
while being blind to collar, or flying an airliner without entrance. The mythological confusion that would result from such attempts is the same as that found in decapitated science where reality is left out, and pseudo-reality is artificially created to hide what is actually true, to counter it, to prevent demonstrable science. As one might expect, the mind-crippling confusion is hailed and defended by all the king's men and their stooges. It is even hailed by some of the noblest advocates of science who knowingly cripple themselves with it, who thereby assure, unintentionally perhaps, that the rich colors of the universe that also include the Ice Age dynamics remain unrecognized in society until it is too late for anyone to respond to the astrophysical dynamics that have now begun to affect us. If this tragedy is continued beyond the point of no return, the point where humanity, the natural titan, having been decapitated to play the role of a mouse, dies. The global warming doctrine is a lie. It creates a myth that has no truth and hides the truth that would otherwise be obvious to anyone. The doctrine vilifies carbon dioxide, CO2. It is said that it is a dangerous greenhouse gas and that humanity has pumped so much of it into the atmosphere that the earth is now overheating. But this isn't happening, is it? CO2 is such a rare trace gas in the atmosphere that only 390 parts out of a million are CO2. Let me suggest the comparison. Consider the global atmosphere being comparable in size to Mount Everest. On this scale, the entire CO2 volume in the atmosphere would be comparable to the size of a man standing on top of the mountain. That's approximately the ratio of 390 parts to a million. A man standing on top of that mountain is rather insignificant, isn't it? And so is CO2 as a greenhouse gas. But this isn't all. The global warming doctrine blames only the man-made contribution to the global CO2 budget as the villain that is set will overheat the earth. With the man-made contribution being less than a quarter of a percent, the man-made contribution would be comparable to the size of a small button on the shirt of the man standing on top of the mountain. This infinitesimal amount is what the carbon trading swindle is all about that is ripping society off to the tune of billions and is killing 100 million people a year by burning their food under the biofuels travesty. And still, the global warming scam gets more absurd than this. Look at where in the solar radiation spectrum the CO2 absorption band is located. You can find that the rare trace gas, CO2, plays a role only in the low energy region of the radiation spectrum where the sun's energy is at its weakest. Thus, the resulting influence of CO2 on the greenhouse effect is so minuscule that it is for all practical purposes non-existing, and much less so the human addition that is insignificant itself. 
it is generally acknowledged that 97% of the Earth's greenhouse effect is produced by water vapor in the atmosphere. The remaining 3% is divided between the other greenhouse gases, of which molecular oxygen plays a major role that exists in large quantities in the atmosphere in the order of 20%. On the basis of this global warming hoax, food is being burned in automobiles that would normally feed 100 million people, and industries are being shut down as polluters and so forth, while empire demands that the world must be depopulated by 6 billion people to save the Earth, or more precisely, to save the empires. Evidently, it was for this brutal goal of ultimate mass depopulation that the global warming doctrine was invented in the first place, as it would assure this desired mass depopulation if it was to remain in control of humanity. The doctrine has been invented in 1974 to block the recognition of the Near Ice Age that the scientific community had been concerned about at this time. The resulting brutal assault on humanity that the global warming doctrine serves is a part of the ugly face of decapitated science. It is not surprising in this context of utter brutality that 99.999% of the mass of the universe is denied to exist, considering that the resulting denial of reality serves the ugly, long-standing overall goal of the world's depopulation for which near unimaginable matters of brutality have already been invented and implemented to various degrees. Decapitated science is focused on creating a tragedy in all aspects related to the Ice Age transition, evidently to assure that the point of no return will be crossed whereby 90% of humanity would die as the masters of empire have long proclaimed is their goal. While the writing is on the wall in a wide range of aspects of the Ice Age transition, nobody presently cares to read the writing. This sadly still happens in a big way, while the consequences are potentially enormously large, resulting from what is being ignored. Canada and Russia, for example, would simply cease to exist when the Ice Age transition disables their agriculture and their land, and no replacement infrastructures would have been created with which these nations would continue to exist as nations. Since the dynamic nature of the Ice Age transition is such that large and rapid fluctuations should be expected, as we have seen it in time frames as short as ours in the case of the gamma ray bursts in the Crab Nebula in 2011, or whether the transition will be as long as 50 years as the Polish professor Zbigniew Jaworowski suggests, we should not be surprised when we actually see them happening in various ways, as they all reflect the nature of the dynamics of electric processes. While in the decapitated science, the sun is regarded to be an invariable constant. In the real world, this is far from being the case. The luminance of the sun already varies by a factor of 20 in the high UV band during the course of the 11-year solar cycles. If we look through the holes of the photosphere in the sun, which the sunspots provide as they expose the lower layers, we see a much colder sun, 
at those lower layers. What we see suggests that the sun was much colder during the long glaciation period. It might have been as cold as 3,000 degrees Kelvin. In this context, the current sun is an anomaly, with the sun being much dimmer during the cold interglacial climates. The changing luminance of the sun appears to be one of the most critical elements of the Ice Age transition, and the hardest one to accept, even while nothing else makes any sense. The steep drop-off in temperature that the ice core data indicates in the boundary region to the previous Ice Age could not be possible in the theorized anthropic universe where the sun is regarded as a steady-state fusion furnace, burning by its own fuel. This enigma doesn't exist in the anti-entropic universe where the sun is electrically powered, where large fluctuations are not only possible, but are expected as boundary phenomena of a powerful electric system changing from a high-intensity state to a low-intensity state. A potential cause for large and sudden fluctuations in the power of the sun might be a sudden rupturing of the heliosphere, similar to the rupturing of the solar photosphere that causes mass ejections and leaves sunspots in the wake. The Ulysses satellite saw the solar wind pressure reduced by 20% over the space of a decade and saw cosmic ray numbers increased by the same percentage as a result of a weaker heliosphere. However, we have absolutely no way of telling what the result will be when the solar wind pressure becomes reduced significantly further. Will then the heliosphere begin to rupture? And if so, what will be the electrodynamic effect of such an event? The heliosphere is an integrated part of the electric system that powers the sun. The heliosphere feeds the heliospheric current sheet, in which plasma flows back into the sun. If a rapture occurs, a portion of the solar system's plasma might be vented into space, causing a sharp, sudden reduction in solar plasma density and solar activity that may not heal itself until the incoming stellar plasma density becomes enriched again with the next interglacial warm pulse. It may well be that we face such an implosive type of rapid fluctuation in which the dynamics of the heliosphere become flipped to a lesser energetic state. The Polish ice core researcher, the late Dr. Zbigniew Jaworowski, speaking from the background of his 50-year career in scientific research, suggested in a 2003 paper, The Ice Age is Coming, that we might see a huge transition happening in as short a time as a single year, or that it might be as long as 50 years, and that the transition event might begin at any time and without any warning. He points out that the Earth has been in the time frame where a transition should be expected for a few centuries already. The rupturing of the heliosphere could facilitate the kind of large-scale transition event that he suggests we should expect to see happening. Large efforts are being made to study how the solar system operates, but observing the present state doesn't necessarily offer us a looking glass into the future. The Ulysses satellite gave us a hint, 
but it was turned off when the data contradicted the global warming doctrine. Here we find the most critical question rooted for the future of humanity. If we fail in recognizing the Ice Age dynamics and the Sun becomes affected by rapidly changing conditions that cause it to go dimmer in a short time span as Jaworowski suggests is possible, such as which might happen if the heliosphere ruptures, then much of humanity would be doomed as a result of our ignoring reality that leads to false predictions, such as the current prediction that our interglacial warm period will last another thousand years or more. In the electric universe, conditions can change rapidly. We cannot ignore the fact that the universe is electrically powered and is anti-anthropic in nature. Gigantic electric discharge events have been observed high in the stratosphere, up to 100 kilometers high, feeding into the thunderclouds deep below them. The central core and ring structure shown here, called a sprite, is typical for large-scale discharge events. These shapes have been replicated in the laboratory. They become rather amazing structures at high current densities. The plasma physics researcher Anthony Parat, associated with Los Alamos National Laboratory in the USA, discovered archetypal drawings from distant times that reflect the laboratory created plasma discharge shapes. They appear to have been seen in the sky because such drawings were produced in widely separated areas of the world. If the recorded shapes were plasma flow events seen in the sky, they would likely have been seen associated with the sun at times of great mass ejections and they would have stood out easily visible. The existence of these drawings suggests that the phenomena were observed in periods of a dimmer sun. Normally, the solar plasma flows are invisible. Against today's bright sun, they cannot be seen in the visible light band Plasma flows are presently just barely visible during the relative darkness of a total solar eclipse. As the one shown here, photographed by the famous eclipse photographer Miloslav Druckenmiller. In the times of a dimmer sun, however, and in times of stronger mass ejections, the resulting plasma flow events would have been readily visible to the unaided eye. The dimmer daylight would not have blotted them out, as would be the case in today's bright sunlight. The phenomena were probably observed a few days prior to cataclysmic events and were therefore recorded as significant signs to watch for. They might have been regarded as warning signs from the gods prior to the occurrence of massive earthquakes. By recognizing the signs, the people would have been able to seek higher ground and avoid deadly catastrophes. The people would have had up to four days to react. It takes typically up to four days for plasma mass injections to shower the Earth. Only a few rare exceptions have taken less time. What the ancients saw in the sky, and primarily that they were able to see such phenomena at all with the unaided eye, adds a measure of confirmation that we will face a dimmer sun 
together with a colder world during the next 90,000 to 100,000 years before the interglacial resumes anew. The big open question thus is, how dim and how cold will the sun be? If one considers an average solar temperature in the 4,000 degree range during the glacial periods, the sun's energy luminance would then be roughly half of what it is today. In this case, the snow in the polar regions would no longer melt, whereby the great ice sheets would form anew. And even in the tropics, agricultural production would happen at a lower intensity, which will likely mean that we need substantially more agriculture than we now have, or go directly to high-intensity indoor agriculture with artificial sunlight. With this kind of potentially dramatic reduction in solar radiance, enormous changes lay before us as we enter the glaciation conditions again. While it is possible to create new platforms for agriculture in the tropics that can function well in the coming dimmer world, Nothing will get done for as long as the world clings to decapitated science and remains tied down until it is too late to respond to the upcoming changing conditions. This means that decapitated science needs to be replaced with truthful science. This is the single most important key element in the strategic defense of humanity against the coming Ice Age conditions, without which humanity may become extinct. If the solar temperature drops down to 3,000 degrees, fully self-contained into agriculture with artificial sunlight and artificial environments may become a necessity. Together, with artificially enhanced agriculture build a float across the tropics. How cold will it get? We know from ice core samples from Greenland that the previous glacial period had been 30 to 50 times colder than the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age gave us a half a degree cooling in comparison with the 15 to 20 degree cooling that the glaciation period had brought. But can we accurately forecast what this means for agriculture? We probably can't. The only safe option for the strategic defense of humanity against the coming ice age would be to prepare for the utmost possibility Actually, it doesn't really matter how fast the Ice Age transition will take the Earth back to the deep glaciation state. Ice core samples from Greenland indicate that the previous deep transition took more than a thousand years to unfold, or several thousand years. The samples also tell us that the glaciation period wasn't as stable as one would expect but was a period of very large temperature oscillations near the end of it, with sudden warm spikes that reached nearly halfway back to the interglacial level, which then slowly dropped back off in the space of 400 to 600 years. It may well be that we will see these types of fast transitions reflected again during the transition period that has already begun, especially if one considers that the current interglacial epoch will be significantly colder than the previous one had been. We need to consider that the entire Pleistocene epoch in which the Ice Ages unfold is essentially getting progressively colder overall because the two very long cycles, 
the 62 and 144 million year cycles are both still moving towards their respective low point, which overlap. All this means that we have no actual historic data to use as yardstick for the coming transition period. Our present situation is unique in geologic time. However, do we really need to know how long it will take before the Earth will be 50 times colder than the Little Ice Age had been? Our primary concern has to be to determine at what stage agriculture becomes disabled in our in our northern food producing regions, and at what point the northern hydroelectric power complexes stop operating when the snow no longer melts in the summer. During the Little Ice Age that corresponds to half a degree cooling. Agriculture was so severely affected throughout Europe that 10% of the population starved to death, and up to 30% in the northern regions. If the weakening of the sun continues that NASA's Ulysses satellite had measured the beginning of, we may be in a cooling trend towards five times colder climates than the Little Ice Age in 50 years' time or sooner. So how do we react? The human response would be to start a worldwide renaissance to develop the needed infrastructures to be able to relocate the entire northern agriculture into the tropic regions where the new Ice Age climate cannot reach to, regardless of how fast it may unfold. Since there is little useful land in the tropics to absorb the vast northern agriculture, we have no choice but to create our own land by placing agriculture afloat onto the tropical seas. This can be done. With large-scale floating agriculture laid down across the equator and indoor agriculture in the marginal zones, a rich food supply is presently possible to be implemented for any size of population. This is easily done with nuclear-powered automated high-temperature industrial processes, utilizing basalt as a feedstock. In fact, this will be the fastest and easiest way to create new agriculture and a new industrial revolution with it. Of course, we won't get anything done if we don't start. And the critical start won't happen until truthful science reveals the urgency sufficiently so that it can be acted on. This critical requirement that the future places on us renders truthful science one of the most critical moral requirements of our time. Anything less becomes a crime against the future, because by society's failing at the present critical stage, with the next fifty years becoming supercritical, humanity could become extinct. The liberation of science to truth for science needs to occur. Unfortunately, we are far from that. There is little intention existing, and much less a commitment to build on the already recognized urgency. People still keep on lulling themselves to sleep with the age-old song, It won't happen to me. It won't happen in my time. The story of the airplane that turned off its engines and then jettisioned them as a dead weight is useful here. With the engines gone, the captain lost all his controlling power. As he faces the passengers while sipping his double martini, he may be saying to them, 
Don't worry, nothing will happen. If any of you ever experienced an airplane crash in your entire life, these things don't happen, people. They didn't happen to you, and so nothing will happen this time either. These would then have been his last words preceding the crash. Past the point of no return, the game is lost. This is similarly true for society experiencing the Ice Age transition without new agriculture having been created. The dimming of the sun would of course also affect the world's electric power production in a large manner. Most hydroelectric power production would simply stop. In China, for example, the giant Three Gorges Dam electric power complex will quickly stop producing anything when the snow no longer melts high in the mountains. A large portion of the feedwaters of the Yangtze River system originates as meltwaters high in the Himalayan mountains. Then, when the snow no longer melts, which may happen quite early in the Ice Age transition, the rivers will stop running. Even now, power production at the Three Gorges Dam is largely a seasonal event. Peak production is only realized briefly during the summer months, which reflects the snow melting season. When the melting no longer happens, the power production doesn't happen either. The entire giant system then becomes a relic of industrial art. While the power loss along the Yangtze River can be offset with the building of 60 large nuclear reactors, it will take years to implement such a project. This means that the future must drive the present. In the same manner as the Yangtze River power system will become stalled, most of the high northern oil production operations would cease likewise, such as the giant Alaskan pipeline operation that provides access to the largest oil field on the North American continent. The Prudhoe Bay oil field, also the Canadian oil sands operation would cease. The sands contain as much oil as the entire world's conventional fields combined. In like manner, the big Russian northern oil operations would cease and so forth. All of the high northern projects would simply become buried in snow and be disabled by the cold. Ice core samples taken in Greenland tell us that the last glaciation period was 30 times colder than the Little Ice Age had been. How much of that we will see during the coming decade is anyone's guess. It might take 50 years for the Earth to get five times colder than the Little Ice Age had been. Or this might happen in 10 years only. However, the evidence suggests that something big is building up that we have no precedent for, which we better take note of. This means that we need to rethink energy production on our planet. A major part of the evidence that a big change is happening is found in the sharp increase in earthquakes that began when the dimming of the sun began, that the Ulysses spacecraft had reported. A tight connection exists between the two phenomena. With the sun being surrounded by a dense field of electric plasma particles which at its surface power its luminance, the sun also accumulates plasma in the never-ending electric rain upon it. With the plasma particles being 100,000 times smaller than all atoms are. The sun absorbs vast quantities of plasma in the form of protons. However, 
Protons have a positive electric charge by which they repel each other. The repulsion establishes a limit to the plasma density that the sun can absorb. The limit is determined by the external incoming plasma pressure. When this external pressure weakens, whereby the sun also becomes dimmer, the internal pressure can no longer be contained and becomes vented into space in the form of erupting coronal mass ejections. While mass ejections are a normal means for the sun to maintain its plasma pressure equilibrium, the mass ejections tend to increase when the external pressure is sharply reduced that the Ulysses spacecraft saw the beginning of. For us on Earth this means that the earthquakes are increasing. The mass ejections are plasma showers erupting on a scale that dwarfs our Earth. If parts of these showers hit our Earth, they accumulate in the ground at whatever depths they can penetrate to. There, deep in the ground, the same electric pressure builds up that had ejected the plasma particles from the sun in the first place. The solar plasma pressure flowing into the Earth causes correspondingly large electric stress phenomena to build up in the ground by the electric force that is 36 orders of magnitude stronger than gravity. Large stress explosions can occur thereby, resulting in large earthquakes and related events, and a sharp increase in the number of the events as the Ice Age transition unfolds. The actual rate of increase is likely less than shown, as the historic numbers of earthquakes recorded is probably incomplete. Also, the increase is still getting larger from 2000 on to the present. This is what we need to prepare our world for in the increasingly necessary strategic defense of humanity during the coming Ice Age transition. And even in the weaker sun, the number of earthquakes is increasing with the downturn of the solar activity cycle. In the USA, the number of earthquakes per year doubled during the time frame in which the weakening of the sun began. Since a sharp increase in the number of earthquakes has occurred, coincident with the sun getting weaker, for which no end appears in sight, we face the task to prepare our world for the continuing increase in earthquake activity. The strategic defense of humanity thus becomes ever more necessary as we enter deeper into the coming Ice Age transition that appears to be already at its beginning stage. The sharp increase in earthquakes that has been experienced since Ulysses observed the weakening of the sun may well be the most measurable precursor that we can get that a major astrophysical transition is in progress that matches what is known about the dynamics of the Ice Age transition. As I said, that when the situation arises 
that the external plasma pressure around a sun is weaker than the internal pressure, which results in a weaker sun, a portion of the internal pressure is vented into space in the form of explosive mass ejections until a lower equilibrium is established. This is a natural process in the solar dynamics and a critical one for any sun, because if these ejections did not occur, the sun would eventually explode by the built-up electric stress. Such electric stress explosions do actually happen, though only extremely rarely. It is highly likely that the famous supernova events or rare extreme events of this type of explosive electric stress fracturing. Such events would happen when enormously large plasma pressure bears down on a star so that the eternal electric stress pressures overpower the gravity of the star. The Grab Nebula may have resulted from such a process of electric stress explosion. The Grab Nebula is known to be a hotbed of intense electric activities. The Grab's remarkable combined luminance is 70,000 times greater than the luminance of our sun. In lesser cases, when extreme plasma pressures build up in a star, which corresponds with great electric stress inside the star, the overstressed star merely splits apart into binary, triple or quadruple star systems. The resulting electric stress division appears to be not uncommon among stars, to the point that astronomers now suggest that single star systems, like our own solar system, might actually be the minority in the galaxies, or at least in our galaxy. Large coronal mass ejections are therefore healthy for a sun. They occur at their largest when the electric environment around the sun becomes weaker, so that a lower equilibrium needs to be established, as in the case of our sun during an ice age transition period. During the weakening phase, the sun will vent or eject large portions of its built-up mass in the form of large solar flares. While even the most gigantic of these resulting large mass ejection events are nevertheless small events in the larger context of stellar dynamics, they are large enough to cause enormous effects on our Earth, where the electric force builds up with ever more solar flares hitting the Earth, whereby the ejected storms of solar protons cut deep into the ground. As a result, very large electric stress forces exist in the ground. When a major solar flare adds still another shower to this background, this may be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Most earthquakes thereby appear to be triggered by electric stress phenomena that, in some cases, occur over large areas. Closely timed relationships have been evident between increases in earthquakes and the weakening of the sun that the Ulysses satellite had measured. The strategic defense of humanity from the coming Ice Age transition therefore needs to focus on the earthquake factor as also a major factor for the immediate time ahead, because the dynamics involved suggest that we haven't seen anything yet on this front. If the current increase in earthquakes and volcanism is an indication of things to come, we evidently need to reconsider the way we build cities and infrastructures and power-generating systems. Enormously tall dams have been built 
some twice as tall as the Great Pyramid in Egypt, holding back enormous volumes of water. How vulnerable will they be in our world of rapidly increasing earthquakes? Indeed, how vulnerable will our tall cities be? We have no historic data about what to expect in earthquake activity during the transition period, as the sun is becoming weaker. The last such period was over 100,000 years ago. The modern decapitated science prevents the requisite questions from being asked, while the little that we already see speaks volumes in spite of the blindness imposed by decapitated science. The linkage between solar mass ejections and earthquakes is graphically evident in the records produced by the induction magnetometer in Gakona, Alaska, that is the most sensitive instrument of its type in the world. It registered some enormously intense, extremely low-frequency inductions just prior to the big earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Likewise, prior to the giant earthquake in Japan in 2011, the same induction, only larger this time, was seen again for several hours leading up to the earthquake catastrophe. These two events, linked with the weakening of the sun that is just in the faintest beginning, scream to us that we haven't seen anything yet. However, this, which we have not yet seen, is what we need to prepare for. It is interesting to note in this context that five great historic mass extinction events occurred at or near major and at times gigantic temperature downswings. These would be times of the sun venting plasma in a big way to establish its plasma pressure equilibrium. Consequently, these would be times of enormous electric stresses in the crust of the Earth with correspondingly large earthquakes and massive volcanic activity occurring, accompanied by a build-up of enormous electric potential between the ground and the ionosphere that may have resulted in electric discharge events of gigantic proportions. As could have ripped open the mantle of the earth to cause the immense flood basalt eruptions that have occurred during the extinction time frames, that could also have excavated the craters that are often deemed to be impact craters, rather than discharge craters, like the Chicolups crater in Mexico. It has been suggested by researchers familiar with electric discharge machining that the Grand Canyon was evidently excavated by a single electric discharge event and by a minor one comparatively. All the expected electric features are present in the canyon features. While the coming Ice Age transition promises to be minuscule in comparison, we should nevertheless anticipate unprecedented volcanism and earthquakes, whatever this might mean. The huge task of creating an Ice Age renaissance on the needed scale for the strategic defense of mankind literally demands us to develop our inner resources as human beings to levels not yet imagined in order to meet the challenge the universe presents to us. Sure, the challenge cannot be met physically, technologically, and economically in a decapitated world, but will we break out from it? 
This is a spiritual and cultural question. Can society break away from its empire dream of stealing riches from one another that develops poverty and impotence? The Ice Age Challenge should help us out of this dream as the needs for the future should jolt us to attention. It is tempting to say in the current impoverished dream state that the world development project cannot be carried out because we don't have the energy resources to do it. This is true indeed in a decapitated world, but not in the real world. In the real world, we have infinite energy resources laying at our feet, unacknowledged and unused. The same electric energy that powers the sun electrically is also available to us on Earth by the same process, though with lesser intensity. NASA has photographed Mars electric energy streams encircling the Earth in the ionosphere, which we can tap into. We have observed the same two energy bands on the Sun for decades. We see the two bands of electric concentration overlaying the high-intensity background in spite of the Sun's intense luminosity. We see the same process on the Earth that we see on the Sun. The Earth is rich with electric energy. Right now this energy powers only the hurricanes and tornadoes, all the world's lightning and sundry planetary services such as the rotation of the Earth and its magnetic field. There is enough energy in the system to power all of humanity's puny needs for an infinite future for all times to come. An anti-entropic energy resource can never be depleted. It is a part of a system that becomes more energetic the more it is used. We will begin to experience this deeply inherent power at the moment we lay our decapitated science aside and develop truthful science. For this, humanity needs to cancel the existence of empire, the greatest crime against the future that has ever been perpetrated, which imposed the decapitation through the channels of its numerous royal societies. Empire and decapitation is one, and this one is the most nearly infinite crime against the future. Empire is a system that wages war on humanity on all possible fronts, in economy, finance, politics, and science. It destroys, steals, murders, decapitates, and even demands the population. It presently steals from society in ever greater bursts of madness and financial trickery, which, to keep the process going, legalizes the crime itself in order that the crime won't be arrested, whereby empire continues to be able to exist. This is what Illustration B is all about. The chart illustrates the functioning of the system of empire, a monetarist empire, a vast empire of private money estates that exist typically for the single purpose of looting ever more wealth from society. The result is a process of economic decapitation, the decapitation of finance and politics are but auxiliaries for it, together with the decapitation of science. It all comes together at the one fundamental point where nothing rests on universal principles that confer power, where nothing works anymore where humanity is about to collide with reality. This point is the abyss, a trap, a dead end. Since 
the empire's wealth is stolen. Instead of having been created by it, empire has extracted from the golden goose the very power that has made the golden goose creative and productive, which is the physical economy of society where all real wealth is produced. However, by this process, the stolen loot becomes itself meaningless, which is a claim against what the golden goose creates and produces that increasingly adds up to zero. That's where we stand today. Illustration B describes the current empire world system, a decapitated system, a system of thievery that has collapsed the world and itself with it to the point of the near disintegration of everything. All the wars that were ever fought, and those presently threatened against Iran, Syria, North Korea, and so on, and ultimately against Russia, China, and India, have at their root the lootings that empire requires to draw ever more fresh blood that it pours under the corpse of the system that is already dead, which nothing in the world can revive. Illustration A presents the opposite. It illustrates the functioning of natural economics, the real world's creating platform, a development platform on which society truly becomes rich in living to the point that the concept of wealth no longer has any meaning. On this platform, a nation creates itself whatever financial credits are needed to produce the infrastructures for its living and to develop them in the most efficient manner possible. These infrastructures include farming, housing, transportation, industries, healthcare, education, culture. These are the engines for creating a richer and fulfilling life as they produce the richest renaissance of all times, a renaissance so powerfully creative and productive that we can snub the Ice Age and say to it, Where is your sting? The illustration A illustrates the original American system of economics. It was pioneered before the USA was even thought of, back in the mid-1900s, in the days of the Bay Colony of Massachusetts. The colonists needed to build an ironworks for making farm equipment. Instead of begging from the money bags of the British king, they issued a credit to themselves in the form of a scrip that became their money for building the ironworks. The script became valuable by the products that were produced and by the richer farming that was thereby enabled. The credit system that was pioneered by the Bay Colony illustrates the future of humanity. The credit system is a system free of empire, a full-blooded, non-decapitated economic system. Credit may take different forms, but it will always be a credit in principle for the development of society. The best illustration of the nature of economics is of course found in the operation of the universe itself, where economics is a process of dynamics. Let me present to you the humble hydrogen atom the smallest atom in the universe. It has at its center a single proton that serves as its nucleus, which is surrounded by a single electron that is itself a thousand times smaller than the proton. The two parts carry a complementary electric charge, whereby they attract each other by the electric force. However, they cannot collide because at very close distances the two particles repel each other by another principle. 
In this dynamic interplay, the electron, which has 50 times less mass than the proton, is drawn into an endless dance around the proton that is forming a shell defined by its dance. What results from this is significant. The shell created by the dance gives the atom its shape, and the shape of it, in the case of the hydrogen atom, is 65,000 times larger than the sum of the two parts that construct it. That's the nature of the type of economic process that the universe itself is built with. The universe uses two tiny particles and invests a significant amount of energy into its productive processes to get the dynamic dance started. Once the resulting construct is produced by the interplay of energy and creative principles, the resulting product is 65,000 times larger than its parts. This is the nature of the universe's basic economic gain. In order to illustrate to yourself how big this gain is, which cannot be drawn in scale, I invite you to compare the single proton that is at the center of the hydrogen atom with a large grapefruit. Its minuscule dance partner, the electron, that spills around it, which is a thousand times smaller, would on this scale be comparable to a grain of table salt. On this scale, the real nature of economics comes to light, because the shell that becomes defined by the dance of the grain of table salt would be comparable in size on this scale to Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on Earth. That's an amazing economic gain. The universe uses two particles comparable to a grapefruit and a grain of salt and creates a dynamic construct with it that is comparable to Mount Everest. This amazing creative process is the process of real economics in which the entire visible universe literally is produced. Well, we are still a long way off in matching the universe and its economic gain. The principle is nevertheless the same in our case, and we are progressing along this line. The new industrial revolution that is based on the use of basalt would bring about in automated high-temperature industrial processes, for example, free universal high-quality housing that would so uplift the living condition of society that a broad-based intellectual renaissance would unfold, that would uplift civilization in a completely new level to powers of its self-development and expressions not seen before. The credit put into this system might well result in a 65,000-fold gain for society. The gain thereby becomes so huge that the concept of credit becomes disassociated from the concept of repayment. The repayment then is found in the value of what is produced. The comparison that is presented here is intended to open the door to understanding the principle of created value. The outcome of the dynamics of the created process is the value of it. If no energy was invested into the economic process of the universe for its atom building, not a single atom would exist, and consequently the universe we behold would not exist. This means that the universe that resulted from the creative process is of immense value that is defined by its existence, because without it, the cosmos would be an empty void. The created value is therefore as immense as the value of the universe itself, 
because nothing would exist without the energy and the principles being invested into the creative process that produces a product of value. In this context, the universe is a product of great value. Its existence is its value. Of course, this simple creative process isn't quite enough for the universe to express its vast potential. Creating hydrogen atoms would be enough to create a sun. Every sun is deemed to be a giant ball of hydrogen. Also, a few of the gas giants of the outer planets of our solar system would exist, which are largely made up of hydrogen. However, if this was all there was, the universe would be a dull place. Naturally, the universe didn't stop at its economic process with building merely hydrogen atoms. It created higher-level principles which manifested into its economic process enabled the production of impressive arrays of larger atoms, more than a hundred different types in all, which have been created thereby. With these, the universe created itself a qualitative uplift in expression with a corresponding uplift in value. Still, the universe didn't leave it with that. It created itself still more high-level principles, which it invested into its economic process that thereby expanded in leaps and bounds. The universe did this in the form of creating principles for joining the basic atoms into molecules that form vast chains of atoms all strung together into a wide variety of ever more complex arrangements. With these added principles invested into the process, the quality of the universe became immensely expanded. The added principles enabled a near-infinite uplift of the diversity, complexity, and creative freedom of the universe itself. The resulting uplift is of course reflected in the effective value of the thereby created universe. The resulting value is thereby correspondingly increased. It is reflected in the infinite variety of worlds upon worlds that came to be, which would otherwise not exist. With the process further expanded, with still more higher order principles being invested into the economic process of the universe, life was enabled to unfold. The produced result added still another increment of value to the economic product that the universe itself is. The resulting miracle of value that we call life gives the economic process a near-infinite value. The resulting value is immensely great because any world without life in it is a dull and trapped place. The universe appears to be designed to invest ever more of itself in terms of energy and principles to always advance its creative potential. It invests immensely on this platform and gains immense value it by doing so. It keeps on investing in itself, in its creative process, whereby it gains ever greater value without any limits in sight. We ourselves are evidence of that. We may see ourselves as standing at the pinnacle of the creative process of life, while in real terms we represent but another unfolding step on the creative scale. We stand today as human beings with vast capabilities and with vast future potentials. Thus, in universal terms, the human being represents the greatest value ever created to date to as far as our vision can reach. Humanity has become a creator in itself, a creator of culture, music, technologies, 
science, art, literature. The human being has thereby become the supreme product of the universe and an economic producer of value itself. Nothing is greater in this of greater value than the human being in the universe for as far as we have been able to explore it. Humanity has by its very being and its own economic and cultural self-development accelerated and expanded the creative economic process of the universe. Without the human being becoming active in the universe, the earth could have spun on its axis for 10 more billions of years and what you see here before you would not have been created to exist. But with the human being added to the economic process, the miracle that you see before you has been created by humanity with relative ease by the simple investment of a few years of work, a few resources, and the bill of financial credits to get the job done. Since the human being is a product of great value, it is inherent in the human economic process to nurture and protect its value by creating ever more resources for its living. The human being is evidently the greatest asset that a society has. It becomes a form of extreme waste, therefore not to protect, develop, and nurture this asset that is of such great value in itself for its creative, scientific, technological, and productive potential. Unemployment, poverty, slum living, sickness, poor education, decapitated science, are all examples of an extreme criminal waste of the human potential that is blocking even now the renaissance that humanity would otherwise have created for itself. It is a crime against the future to let the greatest item of value that a society has to diminish and not to protect it against the new ice age that is already on the horizon for which the transition has already begun. In order to meet its needs for protecting and developing itself to have a future, society needs to give itself the financial credits to enable its creative and productive power to becoming realized. For this, it needs to develop high-quality housing, accessible to all, with no strings attached, and high-quality education, science, health care, technologies, and industries. If society is the highest element of value in the known universe, then no investment will ever be too expensive for the further development of this value, because in this value rests the greatest economic resource and creative power that has ever existed on the face of our planet. When the approaching ice age requires that all the northern agriculture needs to be relocated onto floating modules strung across the equatorial sea, then whatever credit is required to get the job done will be cheap in comparison with the value derived as society assures thereby its continued existence and an advancing civilization that's how the real economic system works that is inherently a credit-based system. When society recognizes that it needs to create a world development engine, the question then won't be, how much will it cost? The question will then be, what resources do we require to get the job done? The needed resources will then be credited Society will get its payback in terms of what comes out of the process. At this point, credit may no longer be called money. It may then have a different name. The entire process will then be determined by what comes out of it for society. 
the return of credit will reflect in principle the dynamics of the universe. When the universe constructs an atom, it creates a structure that is typically 100,000 times bigger than what the universe has put into the building process. Whatever energy the universe requires for it is created and put into the process by it, or else the universe would not exist. Thereby, the greatest investment is justified. This is how we need to look at meeting the Ice Age challenge. We can meet the challenge with the physical resources that we have presently at hand. We can build the infrastructures if we rouse ourselves to invest the effort. The outcome will be that we continue to live and have a rich civilization of great value. If we fail, of course, humanity dies and all that we call value falls back to the level of zero. The building of the World Bridge Project with floating agriculture and floating cities falls into this category. The bridge can be built right now, made of basalt, shaped in high-temperature automated industrial processes for which extremely small amounts of human labor are actually involved. The same process can also produce complete housing modules. They can be produced with so little effort that they can be given away to each other for free to meet everyone's human need, which in turn creates an infrastructure for more powerful forms of living with increased scientific and cultural development. We will need this type of scientific development to create the kind of agriculture that is productive under a dimmer sun or becomes immensely productive in indoor environments or both. The universal criterion for a 100,000-fold gain from credit will be easily accomplished on this type of development platform. Since we also need water to green the Sahara Desert, the little feed can be accomplished with ease by simply diverting the outflow of the Amazon River and the Congo River via a network of arteries made of woven basalt fibers laid across the oceans. Water flowing in water is the most widely applied water conveyance technology in nature in the form of ocean currents. Fresh water can be conveyed with the same ease in arteries afloat in the oceans. The gain over credit that results from the process of bringing water to the Sahara will be so great that it cannot even be measured. Indeed, how can one measure the value of humanity that an Ice Age Renaissance enables to exist in an Ice Age world? If the building of floating agriculture along the equator is the investment necessary for it, no matter how big this credit investment would be, the gain would still be infinite in value. The natural system is so primitive in an Ice Age environment that only 10 million people survived the last one. We can stop this impotence. With a relatively small credit investment, humanity's power for living can be expanded 1,000-fold, even in an Ice Age. That's the nature of credit economics. That's the opposite to decapitated economics. Modern China, and also Russia to some degree, are beginning to lean in the direction of this principle. This, of course, is the reason why these nations are being targeted for destruction by the masters of empire. There is a principle associated with stepping away from the decapitated world of empire, a principle that offers a new life. 
Heaven is expensive. Nothing comes from nothing. The credit principle can only be reflected in an active process. Those who value life are willing to pay the price. They expend whatever effort it takes to advance the sovereign self-development of society to the utmost, as should all mankind in all times, especially now that we are challenged to survive war, economic collapse, artificial energy crises, artificial food crises, housing crises, political crises, and the coming Ice Age transition. We can break the train of poverty of endless crises of decapitated living by meeting the Ice Age imperative head-on, which is ultimately a human imperative. The typical current response to the Ice Age imperative is that its challenge cannot be met. The money cannot be raised to build the infrastructures that are needed. Who will put up the kind of money that is needed for a project for universal world development? What will be the profit that can be made? And so on. And so we ask the wrong questions, don't we? The questions that should be asked should be focused on how we must proceed to get the job done that civilization requires and to do it in a manner that produces the greatest amount of benefit possible. That's how real economic questions are asked. When society needs money for its self-development, it doesn't need to go to the bags that are tied to the past. It only needs financial credits that are credits against the future, and these any society can create for itself as a commitment to its future. Giving financial credit to itself is society's self-acknowledgement that it is an asset of great value with the power to create a future. In contrast, going a begging to the money bags of empire has the opposite effect. It places value in the past. This is a form of self-denial. When society is giving financial credits to itself, it unlocks its power for self-development that it understands it has. It is society's acknowledgement of itself. An IC Renaissance can only be built on this type of platform. The universe does the same. It doesn't go to an external source for power for its self-creative productive economics. It has the power within itself. It is flush with electric energy and plasma that pervades the entire cosmos and powers it. The cosmos is flush with electric energy, which is the most powerful form of energy there is. And it is flush with a vast array of creative principles. These together give the universe the enabling credit to manifest itself in products of great value. The question then that pertains to us is how we must proceed to get our self-development done on the same platform that credits the future. Civilization is the product of human development. A renaissance unfolds when this development is advanced in the most powerful and efficient manner, whereby ever greater elements of value are created. In a credit society renaissance, the question will no longer be asked how much money we must spend to uplift civilization, the question will instead be asked, how many opportunities do we give ourselves to spend money on as a means for uplifting the quality of civilization? The more credit we create on the development platform, which comes back to us a thousandfold, 
or 65,000 fold as the universe has pioneered as a minimal standard, the richer and more productive human living will become. The real breakout, therefore, that we need lies rooted in ourselves. So how long will we want to wait till we feel the time is right to start the greatest renaissance of all times? Meeting the greatest challenge brings the greatest rewards. Why should we want to cheat ourselves by holding back on building the richest civilization of all times, with free universal housing to advance human development, with limited food resources, and boundless anti-atomic energy resources? Why wouldn't we want to build this renaissance right now? Which is the human thing to do? which would also give us the power to snap the Ice Age in the flow of our self-development. What are we waiting for? We have no reason to wait for anything when the greatest renaissance is as easily created as it promises to be. We have the capacity for a boundless renaissance. Ironically, we don't know yet what this actually means. With the unfolding boundary condition to the next glaciation cycle, a great beneficial resource comes to light on the horizon that the universe offers us as a compensation for the glaciation period. This great beneficial resource is located in the vast increase in galactic cosmic reflux that will be reaching the Earth when the Sun gets weaker and the heliosphere becomes weaker accordingly. The heliosphere attenuates cosmic reflux. The weak heliosphere attenuates less, giving us more of it. While we don't know yet how big this increase will be, it nevertheless promises to be highly beneficial for human cognitive development, as historic patterns indicate. Under present conditions, every one of us is being bombarded with 50,000 cosmic ray particles every single day. They typically pass right through our bottom, without colliding with anything, because the electric charge of the cosmic ray particles prevents collisions. However, as the particles pass through our body, they do have an effect, an electric effect, and this effect appears to be greater and more beneficial than we may realize. The fast-moving cosmic ray particle is electricity in motion. It creates a moving magnetic field. Even without touching anything, the moving magnetic field creates a secondary electric current in the surrounding tissue. The generated electric current minute as it may be, appears to have a profound beneficial effect on our biological systems, which are all electrically operated. The evidence so far exists only in historic patterns. For example, the dawn of written languages that became a pivotal event in the development of civilization coincides with a period of cold climate that logically is a period of high cosmic reflux. The same pattern holds true for all the great pivotal events such as the dawn of Christianity and later the dawn of Islam, followed by the golden renaissance in Europe. Great cultural developments occurred during major cooling periods that logically correspond with periods of increased cosmic radiation. Another example is the building of the amazing temples of Kashu Hall in the 950 to 1150 AD time frame. A whopping 80 great temples were created, all in a small area in less than 200 years, by a rich culture in northern India that had developed from 500 AD onward. 
This development period coincides with the time frame of a generally cold climate with corresponding high cosmic ray intensity. Still another example of this type is the building of the Taj Mahal that some researchers place into a much earlier time frame than is officially recognized, possibly the 1300 AD time frame, based on the carbon data of the wood that was used in the window frames. The pattern that we see here is remarkably consistent for all of these cases. Even closer to the present, a strong coincidence is evident. The big overturning that led to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, which became the only peace treaty in modern history that left no one vanquished, which set the stage for the great cultural renaissance that followed, with many great geniuses emerging on the scene, was coincident with the mounter minimum in solar activity that also crossed the Little Ice Age. Here too, great cultural achievements were wrought that correspond with a period of higher levels of cosmic radiation. One of the greatest developments in this period was the development of the concept of the sovereign nation-state that started with the Mayflower pilgrimage in 1620 and culminated into the American Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776, which created the USA. While the historic pattern doesn't deliver empiric proof, which is not possible. It suggests, however, that the 20% increase in cosmic radiation that the Ulysses satellite has measured might start another increase in humanist cognitive power in our time, and that this process may have already begun. The process appears to have already begun also in the biological world. Theoretically, the increased cosmic reflux should have an uplifting effect on plant growth. This too appears to be visible. I have noticed in our garden that almost all of our plants have begun to grow much more vigorously in recent years than they have ever before. This hosta, for example, that is shown here, has grown taller than our garden chair, and this, in mid-May, long before it even begins to bloom. Some flowering trees, too, appear to have become more vigorous in their growth. While no evidence exists, or is possible, that the increased vigor is caused by increased cosmic reflux, the potential that it hints at is highly significant for agricultural production, where such an increase would be extremely valuable if not critically significant, during the coming Ice Age glaciation cycle. It is interesting to note in this respect, by going back deeply into geologic history, that the tremendous development of the living processes on Earth, that eventually, a long way down the line, culminated into the dawn of humanity, did not begin its leap forward until the epoch of the modern deep ice ages had begun, named the Pleistocene epoch, that gave the cognitive and biological development a tremendous boost. The only comparable deep cooling that appears to have occurred during the last half billion years occurred around 450 million years ago when the proliferation of life and its complexity on our planet unfolded in leaps and bounds. This interesting linkage between the past and the modern times seems to suggest that we, humanity, might not have come into existence if it hadn't been for the increased cosmic ray electric energy that became prevalent only during the modern Ice Age cycles and not before. The modern High Cosmic Ray Flux Epoch spanned the entire range of human history in what appears to have been an increasing fashion. It appears to have 
progressively powered the human development and enabled the development of the amazing complexity of our neurological system and its profound cognitive, even scientific, capabilities. In this sense, we are the product of a profound systemic progression, and an active element of it with a near boundless potential. The long-term astrophysical cycles also indicate that the ongoing systemic progression will become increasingly more intense as the successive ice ages will become increasingly colder for the next three million years based on the two overlapping very long dynamic cycles as they reach their combined low point. Astrophysical evidence gleamed from ice core samples on Greenland suggest that the impact of increased cosmic reflux had a much more dramatic impact on humanity's scientific development than society is presently allowed to imagine. In times of the historic cold climates that would correspond with increased cosmic reflux, a powerful platform for scientific development has apparently been enabled that led to advanced discoveries of efficient principles for agriculture and the building of more powerful technologies. During these successive stages of cultural uplift, the discoveries were increased and the resulting technologies improved. To pass the point at which the created scientific and technological power had enabled in society a breakout from the chokehold that ignorance had had on the power of human living. The evidence suggests that science, aided by cosmic reconditioning, has created a shock front that developed through successive increases in cognitive power. The resulting shock front then suddenly began pushing against empire and its war on humanity. The humanist breakout that resulted caused a tremendous worldwide population expansion from the breakout onward that nothing could restrain any longer, nor anything will ever be able to put back into the bottle again. The shock wave created a phase shift. For six hundred years since the breakout began, the old oligarchy of empire has struggled to hold its ground against the shock front that started ripping through the fabric of fascism, perpetual war, and perpetual stealing that empire depends on. This ripping action still continues, nor can the now increasing shock front be resisted. Resistance is futile. The power of the shock front is increasing with the now increasing cosmic nurturing of humanity that has already begun again. In the shadow of this increasingly powerful shock front, the entire strategic landscape of the world that none of us can likely fully fathom has no historic precedent that we could use as a reference point. We are in a boundary zone to an unprecedented world. Thus, while the shock front keeps on growing and empire keeps crying in its death agony, demanding the depopulation of the world, screaming with grotesque choruses of lies and convoluted lyrics and imaginary apocalyptic tales, their cries and threats and promises of doom for the world are cries into the wind without a wail. Against the now increasing shock front, resistance truly is futile to the extreme, both for empire and for society. A new wind is blowing. The current response by empire shouldn't surprise anyone, therefore. The masters of empire face a situation without hope for them. They understand the astrophysical reality that they try to hide from humanity. They understand its dynamics. 
they see the really big humanist shockwave already swelling up against them to the point that their games don't work anymore and they are scared. And this is not something that is merely on the horizon. It is here and they know it. It is unfolding. The transition state to the next glaciation cycle or the new ice age as it is commonly called is in progress at its beginning stage. They know resistance is futile, for which they have become desperate. NASA's Ulysses satellite has reported a 20% increase flux of high-energy electrons over the space of its 16-year mission. This discovery must have caused such a big shock throughout the Empire system already that back in 2008, the Ulysses satellite, the Ulysses satellite was subsequently turned off. For both Empire and humanity, the time has come to acknowledge that resistance to the unfolding shock front is indeed futile. It is hopeless to cling to traditions that have their foundation ripped away. The supersonic shock wave that the masters of empire feel the beginning of and society still largely tends to ignore is so powerful in the field of aircraft dynamics that it can rip an airplane apart if its design is such that the aircraft doesn't fly inside the shock front cone. In aircraft physics, the shock wave phenomenon supersedes all known laws of fluid dynamics that were the only applicable law recognized up to this point. Once an aircraft is pushed faster than the speed of sound, a new facet of reality unfolds that cannot be understood in terms of the concepts of the general fluid dynamics. A totally different world erupts at this point. The shock front of the jet car named Thrust SST, the moment it entered the supersonic arena, expanded hypersonically so fast that the entire shock front appeared instantly on both sides and moved abreast with the car at the speed of sound. This kind of new reality in dynamics is what the Ice Age transition is promising to humanity with numerous potentials. It will inspire us to create a new world and a new civilization with creative powers not yet realized, even while it poses some challenges along the way, such as the challenge to relocate most of the world's agriculture. While this may seem like a huge challenge, it can be easily met. Nevertheless, the transition period ahead also has some critical elements. In this transition, empire will vanish, and everything that is left to it, just look at the shock front that is already hitting the fantasy threat of monetarist wealth. A shock front develops when an aircraft is pushed faster against an air mass then the air mass can flew out of the way. That's when higher level principles take over. By these principles, the shocked air blows out perpendicularly. Empire will blow out in such a fashion. Money estates will blow out too. And whatever else is presently still called wealth and status, what is falsely called science, will blow out likewise. The widespread glaciation that will result with the astrophysical new ice age will most likely have the smallest effect in our changing world. In comparison with the high-powered development in our humanity that we will see, which we are about to get into from an already flying start. In this sense, we are the children of the ice ages of the Pleistocene epoch the children of a systemic progression that we are contributing to with our own unfolding dynamics. This development epoch 
will likely increase for another 3 million years and level out until about 10 million years from now. No fiction writer has yet imagined the deep-reaching and powerful fundamental uplift this promises to bring about. The people who came out of the last ice age, who saw the beginning of this uplift, had built the great pyramids in Egypt which researchers suggest may have been built as early as 12,800 years ago, contrary to official perceptions. These pyramids are the product of people of extremely advanced skills in geometry, astronomy, and mathematics that became lost during the interglacial cosmic ray famine. The pyramids that the Egyptians had built 4,500 years ago didn't come anywhere close to matching the quality and design that is inherent in the great Giza pyramids. Today, society marvels at the ancient's achievement to the point that many suggest now that the pyramids couldn't have possibly been built by human beings in primitive times more than 4,000 years ago so that many success now that the pyramids had been built by people from outer space. For the same reason, doubts are now spreading that success that humanity has never set foot on the moon either, that the entire Apollo project was mere theatrics, as they insist that this couldn't have possibly been done, because such a feat, as they insist, is impossible to do. Instead of being trapped into this kind of decapitation of our self-perception as human beings, we should see in the pyramids an echo of ourselves as creators with a profound spirit, with a great protective power, and with a profound commitment to the universal welfare of all that may be termed universal love. These are the human qualities that the last Ice Age had nurtured and had developed into a type of renaissance that had enabled the construction of the gigantic pyramids that still stand today as monuments built in the shadow of the previous Great Ice Age renaissance. All the previous wonders of the world are coming back into focus here as the new shock front is unfolding and greater things will become possible, such as putting an end to nuclear war and empire that demands war and depopulation. Humanity has tried in vain for millennia already to reach the goal to end empire. It failed for the lacking recognition of the needed principle for getting it done. Humanity has failed for centuries, by not acknowledging itself as human beings, and this all the way to the modern times. In the 1980s, a vast strategic defense project had been proposed to intercept intercontinental missiles in space. The proposal was based on the premise that we do not have the power as human beings to live without war, so that war must be prevented physically. With this, we lied to ourselves once again. The strategic defense of humanity against the Ice Age incursion needs to be built on the opposite premise. It needs to be built on the premise that as human beings we have the power and the unity in our humanity to uplift the world into the greatest renaissance of all times where the Ice Age has no sting for us. It needs to be built on the principle of the universal kiss, the kiss of Westphalia that ended 100 years of war in 1648. The universal kiss that fulfills the common aims of mankind towards building a brighter, secure future, brighter and more secure than any that has ever been aimed for with the greatest challenge along the way to be overcome, is a kiss for the precious that humanity is. It is a kiss 
for what is lodged in all human hearts. The Ice Age Challenge is of a type that will inspire the universal kiss that has so far been left out of all equations. For this reason we will succeed, powered by the universe itself, and so we will succeed in relegating fascism, war, empire, monetarism, looting and slavery into the trash can of history. This will happen as a secondary issue along the way. The shockwave is already moving. Wells no longer inspires respect, but disgust for the thievery by which it was stolen from the living of humanity. A new type of geometry is unfolding, in which respect is inspired by achievements for a common, richer world in the flow of the universal kiss. In this amazing context, our renewed Ice Age Renaissance, that we have the potential to meet and are already seeing the beginning of, will not be seen as something extraordinary and miraculous in future ages, as it seems now, but will be seen as commonplace and as natural as breathing the air. Should this also be the way in which we face the challenges right before us now? We will likely find that as we gain our liberty from the prison cave of decapitated science and step into the Renaissance, that we will do so joyously with a song on the lips as we watch the old world fade out of sight. Towards this end, I wrote a novel on the subject of our universal love for one another as human beings. I started to explore what a great renaissance would look like in the social domain and how it might develop at the grassroots level of our individual living. This became an amazing challenge to which I later applied the title Discovering Love. However, the subject turned out to be so vast that the writing of more than just a single novel became necessary to explore it. This became apparent during the writing of the work. The principle of universal love came to light as vastly encompassing. From this beginning, a series of 12 novels was created, carrying a single theme and a single story though multifold in discoveries. The second novel of the series, The Ice Age Challenge, brings the challenge of the returning Ice Age somewhat to the foreground. The novel is built around it, but not in the typical cataclysmic fashion. It deals more with the task of stepping away from the systems of empire in steps of securing our future. Neither of these aspects has been mastered well in society to the present day, nor have they even been acknowledged as challenges. Against this background, the size of this particular novel became rather large. It took still another novel to explore the complexities further such as that of meeting the very simplest challenge of universal love on the home ground at the grassroots level. The civilization that we have created on our planet, as tragic and precarious it is, has become interlaced with wars, slavery, destruction and deprivation, which have set a stage on which we stand poised to destroy ourselves, but this was not imposed on us by forces from outside of our planet. We have created the mess we are in, and we find ourselves forced by the tragedy of the consequences to pull ourselves up to higher ground, no matter how difficult that may seem. The novel, Roses at Dawn in an Ice Age World, deals with these difficult complexities. 
My next novel in line, Winning Without Victory, explores this higher challenge on a wider plane. The challenge here is building a taller platform for oneself that doesn't end, but solves the challenges. The challenge at this point becomes to pull up the world behind one as one raises oneself out of the easy chair to higher levels, lifting the world up to the same level. That's the piece of West failure in the nuclear age. Along this line, the exploration of the principle of universal love, the series of novels, became a series of golf novels with ever-widening horizons. In this context, the novel Seascapes and Sand deals with the muddy waters of political seascapes and religious seascapes and castles built of sand. Nor can one stop there, because still greater forces act on our world than just politics and religion. The novel, The Flat Earth Society, sets the stage for that. These are forces unfolding in the world that one can only see with the mind's eye, and needs to develop the principles for to be able to raise oneself above them. Occasionally, achievements in ancient cultures can also aid in raising one to higher ground. India is rich in these, though many of the riches remain locked up by mysteries. The mysteries have become glass barriers that beckon one to see through, but not to shatter. In central India, 85 great sandstone temples were built in a single area in the time frame of just over a century. But almost nothing is known about the people and their culture that had given them the power for such amazing creations. The temples are richly adorned with sculptures of people. About 15% are erotic in nature. Sexual intimacy appears to have been intertwined with these people's amazing creative culture. The next novel in the series, Coffee, Sex and Biscuits, explores this puzzling potential. Indeed, how can we be at peace in the world without being at peace with ourselves and with one another on the home count? This appears to have wide implications. It points to wide horizons. Our horizons for development are endless indeed, and so are the horizons for our self-development where experiences become possible as we move forward, which seemed impossible before. Thus the title of the novel is Endless Horizons. But even in this endless environment, that demand repeats itself to raise up the world with the power of one's own breakthrough achievements. Angels of Sex in Queensland is the perplexing title of my next novel in line. It combines extreme opposites. It combines the sexual sovereignty of the individual human being with spiritual development, juxtaposed against the claimed dominance by people by which no one is sovereign and free. Here lies one of the most critical junctions in the world, and perhaps the most unrecognized at the same time. For the novel, this is the target for exploration, though the novel itself falls short of doing justice to it. It remains but a shower, and a rather small novel for this reason that sets up the framework for which the substance remains yet to be discovered that will enable the freedom of true sovereignty with wide diversity. We live in a brainwashed world where empire, morality, conventions, and small-minded notions dictate the thinking and self-perception of society, and whereby true sovereignty is still far out of sight. 
for the lack of a profound true humanist sovereignty where universal love is the true foundation. Our world has become a dangerous place where no one is secure, where fascism stakes claim to sovereignty and the greatest atrocities are routinely committed to the point that the entire world is in danger. The title of the novel here is Sword of Aquarius, because in our world Aquarius is the cup bearer for the king. It bears a poisoned pool that is poured out onto the world. In my final novel, Blue Mountain, the protagonists of are forced to flee their home country, the land of the free, and seek refuge in China. They are forced to do this by the weight of unresolved tragedies. The whole world is in this situation now, and ever more so with the uranium gas war and nuclear war on the near horizon. Except, unlike the protagonists in the novel, humanity has no place to go to when its world becomes unlivable by the consequences of an unhealed disease called empire and war. In the final novel, the protagonists work from their exile in China, where they aim to reach back to heal their home country and the world retroactively. Their new home lies in the shadow of Lu Mountain. Historically and probably a long time ago, Lu Mountain had lodged many monasteries for healing. The title of the novel symbolizes a reaching back to heal what has been left unhealed for far too long. The series of the novel ends at this point. In retrospect, I named the series in honor of what lies in our humanity as the substance with which our civilization can be healed of its worst perplexing problems. For this, I have named the series The Lodging for the Rose. The sequence of my novels ends where we still stand today. It ends with a huge backlog of unhealed problems that are becoming more critical with every passing day in a world unwilling to respond to their imperatives and even less so to respond to the Ice Age challenge that is nothing more than a challenge to let the needs of the future uplift us in the present to create the greatest renaissance of all times. Unlike the protagonists, we cannot escape to China to escape the consequences of the work left undone. The work needs to be done where we are and soon, or at the very least, it needs to be started before our final war, for which the engines of war are already in place, closes the book on us all for all times to come. This means that the easy chair should be banned. Fortunately, we are human beings with great capacities for extraordinary achievements if we put the substance of our humanity to the task. Should we then not master the challenges before us, even the greatest challenge of all times, the Ice Ages? I think that we will meet and master every one of these challenges, and not just these alone, but step far beyond them to other challenges that we then also meet and master. This is what it means to be human, isn't it? Of course, when we get there, we may realize that we had the potential for all this already eons ago.